episode number 235 of the Wholesome Fertility Podcast. Welcome to the Wholesome Fertility Podcast. Today I'm going to talk about why being mindful or bringing in mindfulness into your life can be a game changer for your fertility journey. I'm going to cover a couple of different topics, most of which I speak to my patients about pretty much every time I see them. So stay tuned. Welcome to the Wholesome Fertility Podcast. I'm Michelle, a fertility acupuncturist here to provide you with resources on how to create a wholesome approach to your fertility journey. So today I wanted to talk about mindfulness and why it's so important, not only for your fertility journey, but really for all of life. In my opinion, it is a tool that can be used really for anything in your life. And it also is a a tool for empowerment because mindfulness is awareness. I mean, they're pretty much the same thing, um, said a little differently and applied a little differently in some ways, but really is just bringing more awareness into your life. And I always say that awareness is there to protect you. It's there to bring clarity. It's there to guide you. And you can literally apply it to anything in your life. So on today's episode, I'm going to cover a couple of different things that can benefit from your mindfulness. And let's talk first about what mindfulness is. Most people hear mindfulness, they think about mindful meditation. And yes, it is a practice, a meditation practice, but mindfulness is not necessarily meditation. Mindfulness, meditation is really training your mind to become more aware and more mindful. But it's something that you can actually apply to every moment of your day and all the different things that you do throughout the day or the relationships that you have or how you approach certain aspects or problem solving in your life. It really is something that you can reflect onto every aspect of your life. And what it means is really becoming aware, increasing your awareness to whatever it is that you're doing, becoming more present with it. So typically we operate on autopilot and that is where our habits, we become almost at the whim of our habits because, and our subconscious mind programming is when we're on autopilot because that is, it requires no presence. Basically you could drive somewhere for an hour and barely remember the scenery because your mind was so hung up on a thought or planning or something completely different. And you feel like what in the world happened to that time from A to B? Like, I don't even remember the drive. I feel like I'm just like here. Why? Because especially if you've been driving for a long time, you have become, it's become so automatic that you are on autopilot and it's just kind of like your subconscious mind is really driving and you're off somewhere else in your mind which means that you're not present because you cannot be present and be off somewhere else. Typically, the subconscious mind or autopilot can only happen when you are not present. It does not happen when you're present. And that is why presence is the antidote to literally anything in your life. Like it's the antidote to triggers that you have in your life or any habits that you have, really ingrained beliefs that are limiting you. It really is what comes in. It's almost like a wrecking ball and breaks up any stagnant patterns in your mind. So anything that is so automatic that keeps us bound, it can come in and clear up and awaken. And it's pretty much like coming out and cleaning out the closet And in order to do so, you have to shed light on it. And that light is your awareness. It is your mindfulness. So generally speaking, again, one of the ways of becoming mindful is becoming present. So that is why mindful meditation trains the body. It's almost like exercising or going to the mindfulness gym 
where you're sitting in a certain position and you're paying attention to your breath. Typically, it's the area of the nose where you're breathing in and out. And although this is not a meditation episode, I'm going to discuss that because the reason why it trains your brain to become mindful is because you are focusing on something that can only be focused on in the present moment, which is your breath. So you're only breathing now. If you're focusing on the breath, you're focusing on the now, because that is when breathing happens. It happens now. And you're not thinking about how you breathed five minutes ago. You're thinking about, you're just focusing on your current present breath. And when you do that, it becomes like an anchor of something to focus on in the present moment. And another aspect of mindfulness meditation is you become aware when your thought or your attention goes to a thought or something completely different from the present moment. So it becomes so subtle. Our mind is like a little trickster and our thoughts, and it's really kind of like People say the ego aspect of our mind, it becomes a little trickster. It'll give you lots of deterrence and it'll pull you in all kinds of different directions. And that is why it's important to have an anchor, an anchor that you can always rely on that is in the present moment. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is becoming aware when you stray from that anchor and it's going to happen and there's no need to feel discouraged. You're just going to keep going back and forth. But the awareness is what catches that straying off the path. And the path, the path is really the present moment. So bring yourself back to that present moment. So when you do mindfulness meditation, it pretty much trains your mind to become more aware. Now, mindfulness can be applied to virtually anything in your life. And the reason I find that it is so empowering, it's empowering in general, but I talk a lot to my patients about this. And the reason why I find it so empowering is because it can bring a lot of light. It can shed a lot of light to how they're feeling. It can connect them to their inner intuition, their inner wisdom, and it can get you to have more clarity in in just what those decisions are, especially at a time where it feels, you feel so unclear because you're getting too much information most of the time, too many opinions all coming at once. And that can actually be very confusing. Even though it's great to get information, sometimes too much information, it's like mental clutter. And that's why taking some time to become present in the present moment takes you away from that mental clutter because all of those mental ideas and thoughts and plans only exist in the thoughts. And the thoughts are not a present moment thing. It's not what's happening right now. So when you're in your thoughts, you're in this kind of abstract aspect of yourself. So becoming aware of yourself, becoming aware of your breath, and anchoring yourself throughout the day. So like having that, bringing that sort of aspect of the mindfulness meditation, but into your life throughout the day can really benefit you because it's going to bring you to a state where you're not swept up in the confusion of just a lot of different thoughts and ideas and directions all happening at once because you're trying to make sense of it and it's it's all over the place and it can be very jarring and confusing and draining you know especially important not to be drained when you're trying to conceive because you want all the energy that you can get so that you're not draining your energy you want to be more focused more efficient and more able to navigate in, in a place of clarity So this is a tool, pretty much if you know your tools, that is the key, that's the trick. And it's kind of like the big secret is really knowing what tools to use and when, because the journey itself is hard. There's no like way to make it easy and it's confusing and it's hard and it's frustrating and it's kind of like going against a lot of um, walls and and coming back and trying again and, and it's like this big, massive jumble of emotions. So that we cannot change. I mean, it just is what it is. It's the nature of the beast. 
But what you can do is give yourself the tools that you can lean on in those times. So becoming aware can help you, can help you with so many things. It can also help you tune into your body and your body's messages and how your subconscious mind that is really connected to your intuition, how it speaks to you. So when you're in the face of making a decision, when you're hearing information just from outside sources, or even when you're looking up information, what feels right to you? Like what feels like it resonates with you in your inner, inner wisdom, your gut that says, you know what, this is just not for me, or this is for me. This is something that I should look into. We've all had that moment where we really connected with our gut and that feeling. And the thing with that is that when you have too much information, that is when the noise starts to happen. And when things get too noisy, then we start to move away from that inner, quiet, silent, peaceful wisdom. And getting in tune with yourself throughout the day, or just even focusing on your body sensations, or even tuning into your breath can help you go back to that center where you feel like you're connecting with that compass within. So that awareness is so valuable. And sometimes it's just a matter of like, let me take a second, let me take a step back. So if you're faced with like a really important decision, if you could just take five minutes and say, let me just sit with this and sit down and like allow yourself to feel the emotions, the sensations that you have in your body, really the sensations, because again, it's just like the breath it's happening right now in this present moment. So when you can tune into that and really feel what is right for you, and maybe journal, it just gives more clarity. Now that doesn't mean that you're going to get the full answer. It's not like you're going to get like this, ah, everything is like so clear right now. Of course not. It just doesn't work like that, but you will start to get more and more in tune with yourself and you're going to feel less frazzled through the process. So doing that, getting awareness with your yourself is super, super powerful. But secondly, awareness of your own body is really important. So a lot of times I highly encourage my patients and my clients to become aware of their menstrual cycle. And it's really simple. It's just paying attention to what happens to your body throughout the different phases of your menstrual cycle. And it is also tracking. Now, I know a lot of people tend to get resistant to it. They feel like it stresses them out. It's not the act of doing it that's stressing them out. It's the, it's how they're perceiving it that's stressing them out. So if you look at it almost like just with a curious observation and also tell yourself you're only going to do it for a month or two, and I'm talking about like the basal body temperature tracking, just do it for a, two, a month or two. The reason I say two is just because it gives you a little bit more accuracy of what's really going on in your body. And start to pay attention, start to look into even checking your cervix, feel if it's hard or soft at different times of the month. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's your body. It's really connecting with your body and understanding what it feels like at certain times of the month. And when you start to do that, you start to develop a relationship with your body. Don't put the focus on when you're doing that so much the fertility. It's more with curiosity. If you approach it with more curiosity, then it doesn't feel so much pressure. Like there's so much pressure on it or it's just this big pain. And then it feels a little more easy to do. And then it might even be more interesting because you're like, oh, I'm curious to see how my body's doing now. And with a basal body temperature, you could see what your temperature is like. And I'll tell you, temperature is really important. It's the heart of the yin and the yang for the menstrual cycle and really seeing like where your body's at and is your thyroid functioning well enough? Is your temperature too low? Something as simple as like taking Synthroid sometimes, and I'm not giving medical advice, but go to your doctor and have them check, make sure and confirm And if they do see that it is a thyroid issue and it's not Hashimoto's or if they can possibly give something 
to help that, like Synthroid, that can really make a big difference. So that is why shedding that light, you know, bringing that mindfulness into your menstrual cycle and your temperature can be so instrumental in your process. And it allows you to really develop a relationship with your body. And if you initially feel that resistance to doing it, it's okay. You know, that's normal. You can have that resistance. And the reason is, is because you're, it's just like when you get to know somebody at first and really you're, you're getting to know your body. It's weird. You know, it's weird getting to know yourself. It's weird going in and feeling your cervix. I mean, certain things can feel a little weird. It's weird paying attention to cervical mucus, like all this stuff. And then sometimes like you'll have other thoughts that come in like, well, what is this? Is it, what if it's not normal? And usually that, those are the thoughts that make it more stressful for people. But I would say rather than putting the judgment in of what's normal, what's not normal, look at it as just curiosity. Like you're just paying attention to the fields of what's going on in your body and just paying attention to the temperature before assessing it, just watch it and see after a month or two, if you can observe any anomalies or, you know, cause you can see basically what is considered normal just to kind of give you a little frame to work with the first part of your, so you're basically your cycle is from period, first day of period to first day of next period. That is a full menstrual cycle. And the first day of your period into the day of your ovulation is called the follicular phase of the cycle. Then you're, you ovulate and then after the ovulation into the next cycle would be the luteal phase. So when you're taking your, you're tracking your temperature, you're seeing And typically what it should be is about 97 degrees for the follicular phase and then 98 degrees for the luteal phase. And if you notice that it should be about equal for both, which means ovulation should be around the middle of the whole cycle. Sometimes people think they have a perfect cycle and then they have a 28 textbook cycle and they realize wait, I'm actually ovulating really late and my luteal cycle is very short. So there are definitely things that you can do about that. So that's something that you won't know if you need to do something about unless you check and see what's really underneath the hood. And that's where awareness can be so huge because you could still feel or see and perceive that things are off before even getting labs. And I, I am actually a big proponent of getting your labs and getting a workup by a qualified physician, a reproductive endocrinologist, if possible, because they know a little more than gynecologists when it comes to specifically fertility health. So all of those things are really important. It's just important to know. It's important to look because why not? Then you have the information. And then based on that, you can start looking at your options And you can work with people naturally, or you can speak to um, somebody in the Western medicine field, like a reproductive endocrinologist, and see what your options are to help, but you won't know until you know. And so that's something that you can actually do to empower yourself, is just becoming aware of your own cycle. There are other options. If you really, really, really feel resistant to doing the temperature, there are other options. They have devices like the Ava bracelet, temp drop, And then there's also sticks that you can pee on that not only check the luteinizing hormone, the LH, but they also check the progesterone. So things like Prove or Uva are really good. Um, Mira is really good at tracking as well. Some of them are a little more expensive than others. So you just have to do your research and see what feels right for you. But definitely checking your menstrual cycle. It's something that you can do. You don't need to be a qualified physician to do so. And you can start to become more in tune with yourself. It is just like tremendous. It's the best gift you can give yourself. And it's so empowering. It really is a step in the empowerment direction when it comes to your fertility health. So lastly, I'm going to talk about also awareness with food, which is huge So not only is it important to become aware while you're eating, but you also become aware of what you're eating and how you feel after you're eating that. So mindfulness with food, I mean, you could, you can pretty much customize it to every aspect of eating every aspect, 
not just what you're eating, but how you're eating. So of course, when you become mindful, and many people do, and it's actually you're designed to be mindful of how you respond to food, your body is going to tell you if something doesn't feel right. And one of the ways that you can do that is you can start food journaling and paying attention, how do I feel after eating certain foods? If you have certain symptoms that you, you know, like bloating, but it could be also fatigue. So it really could range to many, many different things, which is why um, the elimination diet is like the gold standard. It really helps a lot to see even more so, I think, than even taking a food sensitivity test because there are many different types of tests and they sometimes some, you could be sensitive to something and it doesn't get picked up from the test, but it is actually something that you're sensitive to. And if you did a peptide versus a protein test, so things can get missed. But if you do a food elimination diet and you know that you have symptoms and you just remove all of the foods that seem to give you symptoms and then you start to add slowly by slowly one at a time. Yes, it's more work. I get that. But number one, it's free because you're not really changing what you're already doing except for the foods that you're eating. And number two, it's really going to give you insight from the inside out to help you figure out how you feel with certain food, because ultimately your body is so genius, it lets you know if you have a food sensitivity. And you will know because you're going to feel better if you don't have that particular food. And then you can eventually try to introduce it and see if your body responds better if you come off it for a while, because sometimes all it takes is just taking something out for a while and, and bringing it back in. There are certain foods, of course, that you might never stop being sensitive to. So it really depends on you. But mindfulness with eating, while you're eating, how you're eating. So that means not watching TV while you're eating, paying attention while you're eating, looking at your food, smelling your food, being with your food, being present in the moment of eating. And that means awakening every sense that you have, your visual, looking at it, your sense of smell, And then also being able to taste it and chew your food, taking a little more time and really enjoying it, like bringing pleasure to eating and the act of eating and the ritual of eating and coming together with people, you know, eating with love, really like infusing love into your nutrients. Because think about it, that really does convert its energy and you're infusing that energy with a sense of presence. So when you chew also, I mean, it has incredible benefits. It starts to produce more saliva. The saliva has enzymes that you need in order to break down the foods and digest them properly. It also breaks down the food and liquefies it while it's mixing in with the saliva so that your gut doesn't have to work as hard. And it's easier. And then we know how important the gut is when it comes to reproductive health or overall health. So all of those things are like really, really important. And when you're putting more mindfulness into it and more attention, you're also more likely not to over or under eat. You're going to start enjoying food more and your appetite will increase if your appetite is already too low and you will feel satiated if your appetite is too high you'll start to be aware of exactly what your body needs. You're going to connect to that wisdom that you have. And all of those things are just so important when it comes to fertility health, because fertility health relies on overall health. It relies on us feeling better overall. And by creating that mindfulness, that's kind of like you're connecting with that intelligence of your body and your body knows what to do. It's been designed to do that. It's been designed to survive and to heal itself. So those are really important things to keep in mind. And some of the ways that you can do it really is implementing a mindfulness practice or just becoming aware throughout the day, having prompts. You can even have reminders on your phone because I know our phones are always by our side. So why not at least use the reminders on there? Throughout the day, you can have reminders where your phone, um, the reminders pop up saying, how are you feeling in this moment? Take a a minute just to pay attention to your breath. 
It could be even less than a minute. Pay attention to a few breaths. It could be so easy. It doesn't even have to take time to infuse more mindfulness into your life. So that is my two cents. I really do believe that if you want to empower yourself, your mindfulness, just becoming more aware is really where you can find your power in so many ways. You can't change the situation always. And that is the hard part is that some things we cannot change, but what we can change, we can choose to become more mindful in the moment. And that will give us a little bit more of an edge on the situation, especially when the situation is something that is so hard to navigate. I'm always about empowering people. I try to have this practice on my own and I want other people to also do the same, to feel just how powerful they are because we are really powerful beings. So thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you have a beautiful day. So that concludes today's episode. You can find all of the links mentioned on the episode notes. If you're enjoying these episodes, please take a moment to share and leave a review. Reviews mean everything to podcasters and I really enjoy hearing from my listeners. You can also find me on my website at www.thewholesomelotus.com or email me at info at thewholesomelotus.com. I love hearing from my listeners. If you're interested and want updates as well as a free ebook, On my top 10 fertility boosting habits, you can visit my fertility page on www.thewholesomelotus.com. I thank you so much for listening in and hope that you have a beautiful day.